You know, today is uh, it's football Sunday, and we're just we're kind of using the momentum of football in in our nation, in our lives, because because it just has an excitement to it, doesn't it? And uh, you know, I I happen to believe that football can be a window into life. And so, uh, spouses, uh, stop giving your, your husband or your wife a, a hard time for watching football. They're just trying to figure out life. I want you to understand that. And uh, so, so stop giving them a hard time. You know, um, my son plays Division I football for Kent State, that's, uh, uh, and, and they've had a couple rough seasons. I want you to know, um, uh, prior to this one, they, they, they had two seasons in a row. They only won two games. And so when they decided uh, to set the goal to, win a, to, to go to a bowl game this year, that seemed like a pretty long stretch. And in the middle of the season, um, they, they're playing a, a team called Buffalo. That's in their conference. And Buffalo was favored to win. And uh, it looked like that's what was going to happen. I mean, you talk about disaster. It was 27-6, uh, only 7 minutes, 44 seconds left in the game. Uh, Kent State hadn't done anything all game defensively or offensively on either side of the ball. And uh, it didn't look like things were going to change. You know, there just didn't seem to be a lot of hope. And then about 7.44 left in the game, Kent State finally scores another touchdown. And uh, so 27-13, you think, okay, that was one last roll. At least it's not going to look so ugly. You know what I mean? It, uh, okay, at least it won't be embarrassing, that kind of a thing, that kind of loss. Well, they, they line up to kick, and, you know, it's, 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 a long, it's supposed to be a long kick, but, but they, they try an onside kick. Um, Matthew Trickett's their, their kicker, and he's really good. And this is the best onside kick I've ever seen. He, look, he looks like he's just going to boot all the other end, and somehow he brings his foot over the top, and it bounces along, and it's just dribbling along beside him. And I don't know if you know about onside kicks, but, but like the football has to go 10 yards, and the defensive team can't go over the line to get the ball until it crosses that 10 yards. If they do, if they touch it before, it goes back to the kicking team. And so they got to patiently wait behind that line. Well, a lot of times the onside kicks go pretty quick. This one, he had topped it just right, and he's running along. It looked like he was walking the dog. I mean, it was just coming right along beside him, and I mean, he just kind of looking at it. And when he gets to the 10-yard line, he does a pivot, and he boxes the other guy out. It falls into him. He falls down on the ball, and it's Kent State ball. I've never seen one executed so well. So Kent State has the ball, and a few plays later, they throw a pass. It's a, it's a screen pass to a wide receiver. breaks a few tackles, 40 yards, and they score. All of a sudden, it's 27, 21, or 20, whatever the, the number is. It's like, like they're within one score. And, and you, we look at each other like, it can't be. The, the, da, it couldn't happen. And then they, 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 they kick the ball long, and they kick it all the way to the other end. It's the, and, 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 the, and Buffalo gets the ball in about the 10-yard line. And for the first time all game, Kent State stops him on defense. <laughs> There's a three and out, so they've got, to, they've got to punt the ball back. And so the kicker, they're, they're on their own 10-yard line. Dangerous place to be punting, right? But the kicker drops the ball on his foot, and about the time it reaches his foot, a Kent State player comes through, crashes through. The, he blocks the punt, and uh, so it, it's bouncing crazily all over the place. Kent State falls on the ball, and they get it to five-yard line. Like, like, that's almost a gimme, right? And, and so a few plays later, they take it into the end zone. All of a sudden, tie game. Now we're becoming believers. Uh, Kent State kicks the ball again deep, and they get the ball at the, uh, in almost, again, about the 10-yard line, and three and out. They're stopped again, so they have to kick back. That kick goes uneventful. They get the ball back uh, to Kent State on our end, but some good plays later, and all of a sudden, they've crossed the 50-yard line. They're in field goal range for Matthew Trickett, 45 yards, and he puts it between the uprights. And in only about three and a half minutes' time, they go ahead by three and they win the game. I mean, it's just, it just, it, it's amazing. In fact, they said that was the largest fourth quarter comeback by any team in that, in that division. Uh, pretty, just, just amazing stuff. And we would have never thought it was possible. But that was the kind of comeback. And then they got to go, uh, yeah, they got to go to a bull game because they had finished well. You know, I, I wonder how many of us need a comeback just like Kent State needed a comeback, a miraculous comeback. I, I wonder how many of us here today need that kind of a comeback in our life. M maybe your marriage is on the rocks. M maybe uh, you have, have lived a life that you know 
um, is not according to God's plan. You've hurt other people. And now all of a sudden you, you look at yourself in the mirror and there's no respect there. You just don't feel good about yourself and you need to come back. You need something different in your life. And like a guy told me last week, I'm, I'm tired of living like I've been living. I, I need to come back. Maybe you've experienced some kind of trauma. Somebody's hurt you in some way. There's, there's, there's been pain in your life, and you feel like it's 27-6, fourth quarter, and nothing's been happening up till now. There's no reason to hope for any good to come in. Maybe somebody you love has failed you. Maybe you've experienced uh, uh, so much sin in your life that you've exiled all the people away from you, and they don't, they don't want anything to do with you. You know, there are, there are an endless number of people who feel like it's over, L like, like there's no hope for the future, like, like the place that they find themselves in is hopeless. And, and the people in their life have said, you've lost. The circumstances in their life say there's no hope. A and yet they're, they don't want to live where they're at. Th they don't want to give up. And you know what I want us to know today? It's not over till it's over. It's not over till it's over. You see, God doesn't leave us in the place where we find ourselves. He doesn't leave us wondering if we'll ever be able to make it out. So don't throw in the towel because it's not over till God says it's over. And if you're feeling today like it's 27-6, fourth quarter, no hope, I want you to know it's not over till, it, till God says it's over. You know, the difficulty in life is that most of our failures is self-inflicted. Did you know that? Most of, our, most of the hurt that comes in our life is because we've failed. Sometimes it's because other people have failed us, right? It's because of the circumstances and the corruption of the world. But often some of the deepest wounds come because we have done it to ourselves. We have not done the things that God has called us to do. We have not lived our life the way God has laid out for the world to work. And, and so, so there's failure, and all of us have failed. If I went around this room and asked you how you failed, it would be a myriad of different ways, but it would all come back to the same thing. In fact, it would come back, back to Ecclesiastes 7. It says, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does right and never sins. See, the reality is all of us have, have done some things, have, have moved us into situations, have moved us into places in our life where we feel like it's hopeless because of our own problem, because of what we have done in our life. We do the wrong thing and our marriage implodes. Uh, our kids are angry. The, the boss wants to fire us. Whatever it is, because we have moved ourselves into a place where, where we deserve what we get. And no one should be surprised when we blow it. And the, the, the proverb, the guy in Proverbs says this. He says, each heart knows its own bitterness. Each heart knows its own bitterness. See, it's not all the same for all of us, but in the end, we all have pain because of, of those impossible situations in our life because of the circumstances, whether it's through the fault of other people or whether it's through our own fault. And, and there's a bitterness inside. There's a hopelessness that we feel. And you and I, we need to come back. We need to come back. Brandon Marshall needed to come back in his life. I want you to watch this story. We've been married for 11 years, five kids, that's right five kids. Right, and whoever said marriage was easy was clearly never married. Marriage is tough, and this story is about two people who have overcome their past to have the thriving marriage they have today. We have watched Brandon and Mishi Marshall grow personally in their relationship with the Lord and with each other, but it wasn't easy. This is their story. in a neighborhood in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania that now is the poorest neighborhood in all of Pennsylvania. It was very volatile, a lot of drugs. My father actually sold drugs, what he did for a living. But I remember my mother sitting in her room day in and day out, smoking cigarettes and getting to a point where she would have a fifth of Hennessy every single day. There was uh, fighting. Um, but there was only just fighting in our house. There was fighting next door. There was fighting across the street, the street over. Me, she and I married. I thought couples fight. I thought families fight, but you just, you know, that's what happens and you just get past it, you make up. But it was my belief because of the environment I come from. So I had to drop all of my belief, my belief system that was formed starting at the age of two and figure out what is a woman? What is a man? 
How am I supposed to treat a woman? Because I've never seen that in a healthy way. I grew up in a single parent household. My father, and I use that term loosely, was an abuser. He abused my mom. And I didn't grow up in a household with abuse, so to speak, because my mom was able to get away from that. I was molested when I was younger, the age of 12. This is probably my first time ever saying this on an open forum. But to have not ever been able to trust a man, to have not known anybody that would be able to protect or provide, shaped me. I didn't know what it was for a man to love a woman. I also didn't know what it was to love a man, because I didn't see it. Seeing my parents argue or seeing others argue or seeing the dysfunction in my household and, and, and saying, that's not right. I didn't know right, but I knew that wasn't right. There was this, uh, this, this period of five or six years when my life was spinning out of control and I just didn't even know better. It wasn't until I got with Mishi and we started seeking and starting surrounding ourselves with saints and the right people to pour into our lives and diving into the word and praying and meditating on the word where that clarity came. So before I even had children, I wanted to help the next generation of my family um, better themselves. And in order to do that, I have to live my life by example and live my life the best way that I can and the best way that I know how. Now that we have children, it's a whole nother ball game because not only am I responsible for helping them see Christ, I'm responsible for leading them up in Christ. We need to break the cycle. So we went through this whole thing of bettering ourselves, bettering our marriage, bettering our communication. You know, we just worked on it. The covenant that Brandon and I made with each other and the covenant we made with God is that we will break the generational cycle in our family. We will take our marriage seriously. We will show each other grace. We will work through our struggles and we will find purpose in our pain. I just remember praying for four or five years, Father, help me break this cycle. I'm sitting on my knees and I'm praying and I couldn't get any words out and I just started laughing because in that moment, it was the first time I was able to say, the cycle was broken. And it's not over till it's over. The problem is you and I, we can't do the comeback on our own. We can't do it in our own power. We need God's help. And I want you, you're probably saying, well, how do we do that? Well, I'm glad you asked. Uh, God has given us uh, a lot of guidance in his word, but there's, there's a passage I want to turn to today in Ezekiel chapter 37. I want you just to turn there, if you would, page 865. The Bible's where you're at. You'll find it somewhere else. You see, God's word is not silent about how we make comebacks in life. And I want to, I want to look at, at this passage. Now, Ezekiel is a contemporary of those uh, of the Israelites who have been exiled from Babylon. So what's happened, the, ba the Israelites, the people of God, haven't lived according to his plan. They've kind of messed things up. They've gone their own way. They said, you know what, God, I'm going to call my own play. I'm going to call an audible on this one. I'll obey you here, but I'm going to call an audible on this, on these couple things over here. I'm going to do my own thing. And so now the people of God have disobeyed God. And because of that, they've been disciplined. They're, they're being exiled to Babylonia. Uh, the Babylonians have made them slaves, taken them captive. They've torn down their temple. Their king is gone. Their nation's divided. I mean, you talk about that. This is, this is like total destruction. And here's the deal. They've been exiled for 70 years. I don't know. That, that's about the lifespan of a person, right? So just imagine you've got a life sentence. Like whatever you've done that's so messed you up or the world that's messed you up, now you've got to deal with that for 70 years. You're in a life sentence. That's kind of what's happened here in the midst of that. And the people of God, the Israelites are about to give up. They, they think it's over. 
They, they feel like it's over. Maybe some of you here today feel like it's over, the circumstance. Maybe it's, it's your marriage. Maybe it's, it, it's uh, you had this view about how life was supposed to work, and that's self-destructed in front of you. That's crumbled in front of you. Maybe it's this image that you've created, whatever it might be, and now you feel like it's over. God gives, God gives Ezekiel a, a vision uh, to prophecy to the people of Israel then, but he also gives it to you and me today. Because he wants us to know it isn't over till he says it's over. And so let's take a look at this passage. Fascinating, fascinating vision that God gives Ezekiel to give to the people of Israel to give to us. It says, the hand of the Lord was on me. Ezekiel saying, basically, I, I didn't come up with this. I, I wasn't brilliant enough or, or smart enough or strong enough to, to, to come up with this truth. No, this was revealed to me by God. The hand of God was on me, and that's why I can share it today. I hope that you sense the hand of God on you today. You see, it's the power of the Holy Spirit who speaks to our hearts. We can't even understand his truth. We can't understand his word without his spirit in, embedding that in our hearts, opening us up to, to what reality is. And so he's saying the hand of the Lord was on me. That's the only way you get this. This is straight from God. And it says, He brought me out by the Spirit of the Lord and set me in the middle of the valley. It, it was full of bones. What a scene. There's this valley. Now, valleys are supposed to be places of lushness. They're where life happens. I know we think to the valley of the shadow of death, and we think of that one psalm. Uh, that, but, but, but valleys really are a place of life. That's where the river flows usually. That's where there's a lushness. The, the animals all come. There's plenty of game. There's, there's things grow well. The, the, it's fertile. That, that's what a valley is. And God has meant, I want you to know this, God has meant your life to be lived in the valley in the good part of the valley. He's meant you to live a life of blessing. That, that's his plan for you. He didn't create uh, angst. He didn't create all the problems and the corruption of the world. He created it good, and then you and I corrupted it through our sin. And, and I want you to know, G God's plan for you was one of joy. It's one of blessing. He, he plans for you to live in a spacious place. But he brings Ezekiel to this valley, and it was full of bones. Can you imagine? I mean, now, if you get the context, you'll understand that these bones are Israelite soldiers. They've been fighting wars, and uh, many of them have been killed because they weren't obeying God. Uh, they were killed on the battlefield, and this is their bones laying on the ground. They're, they're, there's no more skin on them. There's no more sinew. It just bones. And later on, you discover they're dry bones. What's the, what, what's the, the strength of a bone? It's the marrow, right? It's the middle. It's, it's the strength inside. And you can feel it when they say you can feel it in your bones. That's from the that's from the very depths of who you are, and all there are are dry bones. You know, in the Jewish culture, it was very humiliating when you were killed or, or when you died, not just killed, but when you died and you weren't, you weren't uh, washed and you weren't wrapped in, cl in clothes in a, in a burial cloth, and then you weren't buried. Like that was, that was the epitome of things have really gone wrong in my life. That, that, that's the respect that any person should have just because they're, they're a child of God, because they've been made in the image of God. And yet that's what happens here. We see that that any Jewish person knew when, when there was a valley and it was full of dry bones that like something really dreadfully wrong had happened. And you know why things had happened the way they had? You know why things are, are dreadful, when, that, that things seem impossible? Because they hadn't obeyed God's plan. Look what, what God said would happen to them if, if they chose to go their own way, to call an audible, to not live according to God's plan. In Deuteronomy, it says, the Lord will cause you to be defeated before your enemies. You will come at them from one direction, but flee from them in seven. And you will become a thing of horror to all the kingdoms of the earth. And look at this. Your carcasses will be food for all the birds and the wild animals and there'll be no one to frighten them away. You see, what God had said would happen, happened. That's who God is. He, he's a God who, when he sets things in motion, when he says it's going to work a certain way, it does. And we can either try to go against the grain of what God has created for us, the way he established the world, or we can do, uh, or we can try to stay in line with it. If we stay in line with it, we receive blessing. We're in the valley in a good way. But if we don't, it says your carcasses will be food for all the birds and the wild animals, which is exactly what happens in this vision. They've not done things God's way.
people of Israel. This is really about the nation of Israel, but it, but, but it really speaks to each of us right in our own individual lives because people make up the nation, and, and they've been picked clean. Have you ever felt like you've been picked clean? Like, like the enemy has such a heyday in your life, or he's had such a heyday in your family's life, or whatever. You feel like you've been picked clean, like there's no flesh left, like the bones are dry. M- maybe life is dry. And the big question is, when, when you feel like that image of dry bones, can you come back? C- can you come back from that? I think it's a great question for all of us. It said, he led me back and forth among them, among the bones, and, and I saw a great many bones on the floor of the valley, bones that were very dry. Again, the marrow's gone. They've been there a while. Have you ever, when you're in the midst of it, when you feel like there's a dry part of life, when, when you've been picked clean by the world, when you've been picked clean by Satan, and you're just left there in, in the sun <laughs> to, to burn and to bleach out, you ever felt that dryness in your life? When you're in the midst of that, it just seems like it goes on forever, doesn't it? It just seems like there is no end to life. You just want it to end at that time. And look at the question. I think this is a question God asks Ezekiel to ask the nation of Israel, but he's asking all of us. He said, he asked me, son of man, can these bones live? Can these bones live? All of us want to know that, don't we? We want to know if there's a dryness in our life, if there's a brokenness in in our family, in our own spirit. We want to know, can we live again? Will we always feel dry? Will we always feel a, a, a lack of respect for ourselves because of what we've done? Will we always feel the weight of that guilt and shame? Will we always have to experience the, the brokenness in our family because of all that's happened in our, in our nation, in our, in our city? Does it have to stay this way? Son of man, can these bones live? And he asks Ezekiel that. He's asking you that. What do you think? Can, can these bones live? I, I don't know if that's a rhetorical question, but I believe it's a question that God wants us to answer each in our own hearts. Is it possible? that someone in this world can do the impossible in my life. And he said, Sovereign Lord, you alone know. That's what Ezekiel said. You know. I don't know. You see, until God reveals truth to you, you will never know. Until he reveals in the depth of your heart that who he is, you will not know if you have hope. You know, the Hebrew word for hope means lifeline. It, it means a rope, and so to speak. You see, we're, we're clinging on to something in life. We're, we're finding something as our security, whether it's our, our family, our situation. Maybe it's a relationship. Maybe it's the job we have. Maybe it's this lifestyle that we built up, and we're clinging to some kind of lifeline, or we're clinging to God. You see, you're going to cling to something. And, and I think this question brings us to the moment where we have to ask ourselves, what are we clinging to? What are we clinging to for, for our hope? Maybe it's for our own life. Maybe it's for somebody around us that we love. But what are we clinging to? What's our lifeline? And is it the right lifeline? Because you see, <laughs> some things can produce and some things don't. And he says, Then he said to me, prophecy to these bones and say to them, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. This is what the sovereign Lord says to these bones. I will make breath enter you and you will come to life. I will attach tendons to you and make flesh come upon you and cover your skin. I will put breath in you and you will come to life. Then you will know that I am the Lord. See, it's It's when you and I hang on to God with all that we are, when we listen to his word and then we put it into practice in our lives that that the Holy Spirit comes in us and and he brings new life to our bones, to our hearts, to to, to all the things that we thought were impossible. And so I want to give you the, the two things that really come out from this prophecy that I think are the path 
to, to letting the impossible happen in your life, to the comeback that you're looking for. You've got to lean on the Word of God. He says right in there, lean on the Word of God. He says dry bones, hear the Word of the Lord. You see, you aren't going to do it on your own. You, you aren't smart enough to figure it out by yourself. He say, say my Word is, is life-giving, so hear it. Meditate on it. Live it. In fact, as we go into the Vital Signs series, we're in the book of James. One of the things James says that, that I just love, this is so practical, you won't want to miss that series these next four weeks. He says, humbly. By the way, humbly is saying, God, you're God and I'm not. Humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Do not merely listen to the word and so deceive yourselves. Do what it says. You see, if, if you want God to, to breathe new life into your bones, into your family, you're going to have to you're going to have to listen to God's word. You're going to have to hear it. You're going to have to meditate on it and, and let God permeate in your heart. Then you're going to have to live it. You know, one of the things that we so often do, and I've done in my life, is I've listened to parts of God's word. I've heard it all, but I've listened to part of it, and I've called an audible on some of it. Has anybody else here done that? You know, th there's a coach, and he has somebody in the press box, and he calls the play down to the sidelines who calls it into the quarterback. Why? Because they can see the whole field. They can see everything that's going on. They are three steps ahead or five steps ahead of what's happening. They're three, you know, there are a few plays ahead in the whole series. You and I, when we're at this level, we can't see the forest for the trees. But yet sometimes we think we're we're better than God. We're stronger than God. We know more than God. We've got to, and we don't know anything. And yet we call audibles and say, God, I don't want to do that. I'm going to do it my own way. If you want to have a comeback today, you're going to have to listen to God's word. You're going to have to meditate on it. And then you're going to have to, to do it. Like you're going to have to say, you know what, God, I'm going to trust you enough that even though this seems awkward, this seems uncomfortable, like, this seems too far. I'm scared to try that, that I'm going to do whatever you say to do. I want you to know that dry bones come alive when we do what God's Word says to do. I, I was at the literal end of my rope um, a few years ago. I just, uh, I, I guess uh, there were a lot of things happening around, and I thought, this is impossible for me, humanly speaking, to fix all this. I can't, I can't do anything about it. And, uh, and, and, and I was feeling like, maybe I just want to get off the off the boat. Um, there, there was a story that, that, uh, that was shared with me. It, it, it was a passage out of God's Word. It, it's the time where Jesus sends his disciples. He puts them in a boat, and he sends them across this, this huge lake, and a storm comes up. He sends them across this lake knowing that that storm's going to come up, and yet he still sends them across. kind of blows my mind. Why would God put you in a boat, send you across the lake, promise that you'll get to the other side, and in the middle just do this huge storm that scares the living daylights out of you? Anybody else had an experience like that? Okay, and you don't know how this thing's going to come out well that was kind of my deal I'm like maybe I ought to just jump ship like just get out of this thing I, I don't know how this is all going to work out and in that story I'm sure the disciples felt that way they felt like humanly speaking th this this ship is going to sink and the smart thing to do would be to jump out and swim for shore maybe I can make it and and yet God's word continually came back and it said get in the sh get in the boat and Go to the other side. God promised, Jesus promised that they would get to the other side. But in their own humanness, they didn't see how it could happen. And in my humanness, I didn't see how I could, humanly speaking, get out of the situation I was in to fix it, to solve it, to, 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 move, to move the church forward. And yet God intervened, and he did what only he can do. And, and if you want to see the Spirit of God work, if you want to see a God who does the impossible, because nothing is impossible with him, you're going to have to trust that when he says, get in the boat and go to the other side, you do it. You, you do exactly what he says to do, not even understanding how it's all going to work out, not seeing how it possibly could happen, but trusting that he's God and you're not. And I just wonder how many here feel like, okay, I've gotten in the boat, I'm in the middle, I started out doing what you said to do, God, but now it's not going so well. I, I feel like I'm being tossed and turned. Maybe I'll just jump out and run. Stay in the boat. He will get you the other side. What he promised to do in his word, he will do. He will keep it. So hear it. Meditate on it. And then live it out.
Boy, it will be the, the ride of your life. I'm not saying it will be easy. When you're in the storm and you're bouncing all over the place, it can get a little exciting. You know what I'm saying? It can get a little bit exciting. But I'll tell you what, when you see God move you through the storm, when, he, when you see him do the impossible in your life, when you see him show up like that and breathe new life, it will grow your faith like never before. So don't rely on your feelings. Don't rely on the opinions of the people around you that aren't lined up with God's word. Rely on his word alone. And then, after you've heard the, the word of God, after you've meditated on it, after, after you've begun to put it into practice in your life, give him control. You see, when you give him control, when you're, when you're doing that, you're basically giving him control of your life when you're listening to his word and when you're meditating on it, when you're putting it into practice, when you become a doer of his word, you're giving him control of your life. That's really what you're doing. And then guess what? You will let his spirit fill you and give you new life. It's then that he fills you with his spirit and gives you new life. He says, I will make breath enter you. That has to be the greatest news that we've ever heard from the Lord. We've sinned. We've messed up. Our families are messed up. Our nation is messed up. Our city is messed up. The world around us is messed up, and we don't know how we can fix it. We can't fix it, and we just get frustrated, and we, we feel hopeless, and we feel like it's dry, and yet he says, trust in my word. Trust in me. Hear me through my word, and then I will make breath enter you. The word breath is really in the Hebrew is ruach. Say it with me. It's kind of fun. Ruach. You got to do the ruach. Yeah. It means wind. It means breath. It means spirit. See, it's the spirit of God. And he says, when I'm going to put my breath in you, I'm going to put my life in you, my very life. I'm going to put the animating power of God in you, and you'll be able to do things not on your own power, but you'll be able to do it in my power. I'm going to give you my power. I'm going to put my power inside of you, my spirit, my breath. And you aren't going to be doing this thing alone. You're going to do it in my power. And when that happens, well, let's look what the prophecy says. It says, so I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I was prophesying, there was a noise, a rattling sound, and the bones came together. Can you imagine that? Click, 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 all the bones come together. <laughs> and the bones came together bone to bone. I looked, and tendons and flesh appeared on them, and skin covered them, but there was no breath in them. See, good things started to happen. Sometimes in our lives, we start to see, well, God's working, like, like something's happening, but I don't see it yet. But you start to get the sense that something's moving, like something's coming together. And, and so it's starting to come together. And then he said to me, prophecy to the breath, prophecy, young uh, son of man, and say to it, by the way, son of man means us. It means the people that God has created, right? In his image, that's who he's talking to. That's you and me. That's the people of Israel on that day. He speaks first to them, and then he speaks to us. He says, this is what the sovereign Lord says. Come, breath, in, from the four winds, and breathe into these slain that they may live. So I prophesied as he commanded, and the breath entered them, and they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. It's 24-7. Fourth quarter. Not much time left for the people of God. There seems to be no hope. And yet then the word of God is prophesied. It's revealed. It's elevated. And then the breath of God comes into dry bones and they're made alive. That's what God wants to do in your life today. That's what he wants to do in your family today. That's what he wants to do in our nation, in our cities, in our church. See, the breath of life, <laughs> it fills them, the ruach of God 
the life-giving nature, spirit of God comes in them. And they said so they came to life and stood on their feet, a vast army. And God restores this nation because, because they begin to give their life back to God. They begin to give their person to God. He says, this is what will happen. This is the vision. But this vision means nothing unless each of us, <laughs> unless the nation of God, of God begins to put God's word first, begins to hear it and meditate on it and live it out. And, and through that, as they give control of their lives back to God, I'm going to come in, I'm going to breathe new life into them, and I'm going I'm to restore the, the righteousness of that nation. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to put them in a right relationship with God. I'm going to heal their diseases. I'm going I'm to make them whole again. I'm going to bring joy. I'm going to put them back in the fertile valley. That's what I'm going to do, but they have got to make this choice. If they want to be a vast army, a vast army that changes the world, a vast army that changes their family, a vast army that changes their marriage. If they want to be that, they're going to have to do it his way. And it gives a vision for how you can have a comeback. <laughs> the question is, do you want to come back in your life? Do you need to come back where you're at? Because God can do what you and I can. I love that song, Nothing is Impossible with God. It really isn't. And we sang that song, Come Alive, Dry Bones. You see, that's what God wants to do in your life. Some of us feel awful dry today. Maybe it's through no fault of your own. It's the circumstances of life and, and the sin of others have, have caused a lot of pain in your life and you feel trauma and it, it, you just feel dry. But, but many of us have gone the wrong way. We've not lived according to God's plan. There's a dryness because of that. And, and maybe we've passed it down through generations, and, and maybe it is a generational thing that, that our lifestyle has, has caused our children to fail and have impacted them, and, and maybe our own sin has, has destroyed our family or, or messed up relationships or, or even destroyed our own self-respect, you know what I'm saying? And, and we need Him to come in and breathe new life in us. And then he says, he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the people of Israel. They say our bones are dried up and our hope is gone. We are, we are cut off. Maybe that's you today. Therefore prophecy and say to them, this is what the sovereign Lord says, My people, I'm going to open your graves and bring you up from them. I will bring you back to the land of Israel. Like you won't stay in the place where you're at. You won't stay in that grave. I'm going to bring open wide the gates. He says, then you, my people, will know that I am the Lord when I open your graves and bring you up out of them. I will put my spirit in you and you will live and I will settle you in your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and have done it, declares the Lord. Some people say, well, how, how, how do I know God is real? Like when you do things his way, when you listen to his word, when you meditate on it, when you begin to put it into practice in your life, you do things his way. You just to say, I'm not going to call any more audibles. I'm going to do whatever the play God calls. I'm going to run that play in my life. When you do that, when you give him control and he fills you with his spirit, guess what he's going to do? He's going to put such a joy and a peace in your life. He's going to restore so many things that are broken. You're going to say, only God could do that. And you won't have any doubts that there's a God anymore. See, maybe you have doubts in your life because you've never really trusted God to that level. Now, I want you to know that doubts can be part of a believer's life. But if you said, I've never really been able to trust, maybe it's because you've never really done this God's way. There, there's, a, there's something I want to give you today, and that is how to run the play that will allow hope to return. You see, hope returns when we allow God to take control and breathe life back in to us. Have you allowed God to take control of your life? Have you entrusted the game plan with him? You know, Ezekiel 37 is about the nation of Israel and the brokenness that they feel in their nation. And we probably feel that as a nation. We feel it as a city. We, we feel it as, a, as families, right? Corporately. But in Ezekiel 36, he's really talking to the individual, He's talking about you and me, just ourselves. And, and, and this is one of my favorite passages in all of Scripture. I know I say that a lot, but this really is one of my top, like top two or three. It, it's so powerful. He says, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. No more guilt. No more shame. 
you come to me, I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. I will cleanse you from all your impurities, from all the things that are hanging on that you can't seem to get rid of yourself, from all your idols, the things that you've put too high in your life. I will help you give a, get a new mind and, and, and you will now make me your God and you'll be able to put aside all the other things that you've hung on to. Maybe it's money, maybe it's sex, maybe it's relationships, maybe it's your career, maybe it's prestige, whatever it is, whatever you've been hanging on, you can set those things aside. He will give you a new heart. Well, that's what he said. I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. You see, you aren't capable on your own to get a new heart. You can't just become better. You can, put all, you can buy all the self-help books. You, 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 you can get all the, the, the play-by-play uh, you know, outlines from the internet, but I'll just tell you that no amount of work on your part will change what's happening in your life. But he says, if you'll turn to me, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I will give you ruach. I will breathe into you life, and it will change everything. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will breathe life into you and the dry bones will become live. But you and I are going to have to let go of the rope that we're clinging to. I heard a story of a guy who was, uh, he was close to a cliff. He fell over. <laughs> and on his way down, he hit this branch that was there and he managed to grab onto the branch. He looked down 500 feet. He looked up. 500 feet. He knows he's in a bad spot. So he yells out, can somebody help me? And he hears this voice, I can help you. I'm God. Just let go of the branch and I'll catch you. He looks down 500 feet. He looks up 500 feet and he yells out, is anybody else out there? And we cling to, to our lifelines we say, God, would you help us in our marriage? Would you, would you help me? Uh, like, I've, I've lost respect for myself. Would you, w- would you help our family? Would you help our nation? And, and yet we cling to the lifelines that we've always clung to. And unless we let go of the lifelines of the idols and, and, and the ways of, of living that aren't God's plan, unless we let go of those things, we'll never hang on to the lifeline who is God. And we know God through his word as we, as we hear it and we meditate on it and as we, as we put it into practice as we run his plays for our life. And when we do that, we give him control, and then he fills us with his spirit. And when he animates us, when he gives us his power, he can change us from the inside out. And all the dry bones in our life will come back to life. Do you need that today? Do you need that kind of come back in your heart in your life, in your family, in your marriage, in your workplace, whatever that impossible thing is, and you're in the middle of the ocean, and if the storm has come up, and you're not sure you're going to get to the other side. I want you to know God gave us this prophecy. He gave us this vision, not just for the people of Israel who were, who were in exile for 70 years in a foreign land that was terrible captive but he gave it for you and me today because we're we can be captive in the impossibility of the situations we find ourselves in and yet god doesn't want you to live there he built you he created you for a purpose and that's to live in a fertile valley and i want you to know today that if you've been thinking about giving up and jumping out god wants you to know it ain't over till he says it's over. And nothing is impossible with him. And he's ready to do the impossible for those who will allow him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that it's not just a, a, a series of words on a page, but it's life-giving. It's, it's, it's powerful. It's active. It, it, it allows you to speak to our hearts and change us and And you give us the place for life, but you also give us the power to live life. And when we do that, you promise to fill us with your spirit. Not from a million miles away, but you promise to be right with us right now inside of us. With your ruach, with your power. Father, I just pray for those today who felt like giving up, feel like giving up. 
on their marriage, on their family, on their own life, on the, on the, on the things that they believe God is calling them to do. Father, would you just breathe new life into them? Would you show them that this message today was for them so that they wouldn't give up, so that they would trust it in your hands? And Lord, even though you might not change all the circumstances in their life, you will breathe life into them and they will have joy and peace and fulfillment, the fullness of the life you promised us. That's what you call us to. Father, we are so grateful that it ain't over till you say it's over, that we're in your hands. And for that, we give you all the praise and the glory and the honor. Help our dry bones to come alive, Father. We ask it in your great name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining the Valley Church today. We invite you to experience our worship celebration in person each Sunday at one of our campuses located in either Pickwell or Troy. Services at our campuses begin at 9.15 and 11 a.m. and the dress is always casual. You can learn more about the Valley's wide range of activities, programs, and services by visiting us on the web at thevalley.church. You can also join us weekly each Sunday online at our iCampus or through Facebook Live by clicking those buttons on our website at thevalley.church. People of all ages can experience the excitement and the joy of being part of a growing church that is truly on God's mission, a church where you can belong and discover your purpose in life. We hope to see you soon.